Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. So Phenomenology of Perception, we are in video 12 and we're starting on part 2, the perceived world. So we're looking at sensing today. <clears throat> but before we get into the, this chapter itself, I'm going to quickly look through the introduction um, and then we'll, then we'll move on. So the introduction, uh, just kind of recapping, I guess, some, some things that we've talked about already. So the body we've seen is not a part of the world like any other normal object. There's, um, there's more to it than that. Um, perceiving an object, and the example Merlo Ponte uses as a cube, is more than discursively linking abstract qualities. So this is just a reminder that what we're doing when we perceive it's not a mental or an intellectual activity. We're not taking concepts that we know that we're that we're aware of and, and linking them <clears throat> or identifying them in an object, um, and then and then kind of unifying them so in, into um, into a whole, which which is the object that we see before us. So, for example, considering the cube, we're not taking these abstract qualities, the number six or side or equal um, or angles or things like that and then bringing them together and getting an idea of a cube rather <clears throat> the perception of of the cube is a, it's just a concrete act it's something that um, takes place in the in the concrete world it's it's and it's um it's almost a tangible thing it's something that's it's, it's not something restricted or limited to an intellectual activity and that's often the way we, we tend to think about it we tend to talk about perception as limiting it to the mind but that's that's what we're doing that's the project here so he does he talks about those two dogmatisms again realism or empiricism on the one hand um, and he says this takes the object for granted so it kind of assumes that the object's there that it exists absolutely in itself and um and then and then works from there and so we, we have this again immediately we have this dichotomy between the subject and the object um, and the other the other dogmatism is idealism or intellectualism which takes the signification of the object for granted so now we have the it assumes that um, the meaning of the object is being is, is kind of being put onto it by the the perceiving subject and so that that doesn't then ask and so both of these approaches the uh, empiricism because it takes the object for granted doesn't look any further at the object we don't need to ask any more about what the object is um, because it's just the external world out there it's 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 those qualities that we set that we pick up through our senses, um, and so there's no further nothing nothing more needs to be investigated um, in terms of the external. And empiric uh, idealism or intellectualism does the opposite. Taking the signification of the object for granted means that we don't have to wonder how the object is experienced. Now you know we know that um, we are. Um, the meaning of the object is coming from us as a mind, as as a um, a separate intellect, and and the concepts that we we have, we're we're bringing them to bear on on the object, on the physical reality, and so again, it overlooks that aspect. We don't need to look anymore at at how that happens because um, it's it's something that we've established. We're starting from that. It's a presupposition. And so Merleau-Ponty, the whole thing really, the whole book is Merleau-Ponty trying to get behind these presuppositions and, and investigate what um, experience is, what perception is. Um, a couple of other things of note in the introduction regarding the body. Merleau-Ponty says it's only knowable by taking it up. That was that nice expression that we've used before. Um, we can only know the body by engaging with the body or through the body. So again, it's a very um, visceral kind of earthiness that, that 
permeates Meloponti's philosophy. Um, and it's the way that we know the world, so the structure of the body will then be implicit in the sensible world. We can't avoid that. The way that we, the way that we know the world is through the body, so the way that the world appears to us must be conditioned, must be um, influenced in some way by the body. Uh, and, and that's not something that we ought to abstract out. It's not something we, we ought to avoid, which is the scientific objective um, route, trying to, trying to um, get away from the subjective, from the, the, this kind of the contributions that we make um, to, to the act of perception. But of course, if, if you do that, then there is no act of perception anymore. Um, and there, and there, there's nothing out there. You know, the, the object loses um, its, its objectivity you know, without that, without the, the perceiver also being there. Um, Molo Ponti has a nice expression. He says, the theory of the body schema is implicitly a theory of perception. So just tying those things together. And, he, and uh, we'll turn to look at this in more detail now with the first part, or with this first chapter, which is sensing. Uh, okay, so you might be thinking sensing, sensation, haven't we already, didn't we already cover that? And in a way, yes, you'd be right, we, we did. And a lot, of, a lot of this is kind of just going over the same material, but perhaps from a different perspective or, or fleshing out um, other ideas that we've, we've already kind of have looked at um, in the first part. Um, but that's okay, actually. I don't mind that because when you're dealing with someone like Merlo Ponti, it's always good to, to cover, re, re, uh, to, to go over material again um, because it just, it just helps, helps it all sink in. It's, just, it's, it's so difficult to grasp first time through. It's nice to, to, um, to revisit the stuff. And you f I find that with, um, with Merlo Ponti, I found it with Sartre and with Heidegger. And um, it's never been a problem. I've never, it's not something I'm ever like, oh, God, we're talking about this again. It's like, okay, good. Now maybe I can get it this time. If I, if I read through this time, maybe I'll come to a better understanding. So, um, <clears throat> so yes, there is a bit of repetition, but there's also, we also do get some more, um, like I said, we flesh out more details. We get some, we get some things that um, we haven't covered before. And I think, yeah, I think I'm sure that you'll be able to find some value from this as well, hopefully. Okay, so let's get into it. Empiricism first. We're talking about empiricism again. Understands perception as a third-person activity. Um, and empiricism then, what happens then here is that we perceive a subject who is perceiving him or herself. So we're perceiving a perceiving subject. And the problem with this is that it fails then to notice that original perception, the perception of the perceiver, the person doing the observing. Um, and so there's always this, this kind of lacuna, there's always a, something missing from the description. Uh, and that's because you know, you're, you're overlooking that original perception, the perception of the person perceiving the other person. Um, and if you do that, you can't come to a, a proper understanding of what perception is. All you're getting is this, it's already removed once from, <clears throat> from the original act of perception. And, um, and so, you know, that, that's what, we are, what we're trying to, to recapture here. Intellectualism is a step forward, Milo Ponti thinks, in that we, we do get to the perceiving subject. That was what uh, was missed in empiricism. We, we lacked that original perceiving subject. Intellectualism finds that. The problem is that it makes of this a transcendental ego. And the way it does this is it adds consciousness about to every state of consciousness. So if you have a, a state of consciousness, I don't know, belief, you believe something, um, <clears throat> what intellectualism does is add this idea, there isn't just belief, 
but there is consciousness of belief or consciousness about belief. And, uh, and that's what Sartre does throughout the whole book of being a nothingness. He, um, he, he, he's very explicit about that. And so this is very much, I think, directed um, at Sartre at least. Uh, and the problem is, again, it, it, it separates us. It gives, it gives that distance that, um, that means we're never able to fully uh, account for genuine perception. And that's what he says. The problem with this is the thinker's not engaged in the system. <clears throat> the thinker's separate. It's, he's, he or she is removed from, from whatever's going on and becomes, and the whole thing becomes consciousness about whatever's going on over there, separate from me. And that's also not going to work. So sensation, let's get into this a little bit. Sensation, it's neither a state, neither, neither a state of consciousness, so it's not intellectualism, nor is it a quality of the thing themselves, which is the empiricist approach. Rather, Malo-Ponte says, each quality is inserted into a certain behavior. Now, the example he gives here is when you raise your arm, raising an arm, uh, it, uh, it, the way that you raise your arm differs depending on the visual field you're presented with. And he's, he, uh, he says that if, you, um, if you're asked to raise your arm and you're perceiving a red or a yellow, the movement is smooth. But if, you, if you're asked to do the same and you're presented with a blue or a green um, environment, then the, the movement is a bit more jerky. So what that tells us then is that, that the perception of qualities, <clears throat> in this case color, affects behavior, affects the way that we, um, we, the way that we're engaged in the world, the way that we approach the world, the way that we apprehend the world. Another nice example, the way that we're oriented towards the world. Um, so I've got a quote, let me read it. Sensations or sensible qualities are thus far from being reduced to the experience of a certain state or of a certain indescribable quail. They are presented with a motor physiognomy. They are enveloped by a living signification. They affect in me a certain general arrangement by which I am adapted to the world. They entice me toward a new manner of evaluating the world. <clears throat> So lots of nice expressions there, like the, the one that I, I finished with before the quote was orienting ourselves towards the world. And this is what sens sensations or sensible qualities do. They um, affect the way we are adapted to the world, the way that we direct ourselves towards the world. As opposed to thinking of um, sensations or sensible qualities as, as, qua as qualia, something something that happens in the mind, something um, separate from our bodies and from, from um, our physical engagement in the world. And that, that's, the, that's the moral I kind of took from that um, quote, sensing is more engaged than we usually give it credit for, than we usually take it to be. Uh, an interesting thing, this doesn't happen in the lab. So if you have, if you set up, set up a, an experiment, you know, there's something artificial about it. You know, you're not, you're not raising your arm to wave to someone or to pick something up. You're raising your arm because someone says do it. And, you know, there's no background, there's no purpose, there's no context behind it. Um... As Milo Ponti says, it lacks a living signification. And in that case, when you do it in a lab, you don't get this this effect. The the sense the the the, the sorry the um, the quality doesn't give rise to a smooth movement or a jerky movement. It um, it yeah it just it, it because everything's artificial. Everything's um, the, the act is detached from a real kind of uh, meaningful context. Uh, so that was interesting. 
another thing that's interesting about this is that it's not mechanical it can't be reduced to cause and effect and the, the reason Merleau Ponty points this out is that um, <clears throat> if if the the wavelength of the light that, that, that you're sensing um, say it's red and produces that smooth movement but if the wavelength isn't red if the wavelength is for a different color but the red is, is achieved the red perception is achieved through something like contrast so contrasting two colors and and what's perceived as red even though the, the actual wavelength of the light impacting your retina isn't red we still get those same effects in our bodies so it's not it's not reducible to kind of um, brute cause and effect red wavelength of particular um, whatever it is um, impacting your eye produces some 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 effect there's something more going on there's something it's not just that cause effect it's there, there's something interpreting that there's something picking that up and that's what's that's what's inherent that's what's um intrinsic in the act of perception uh we also so that's kind of a rejection of the the uh the empiricist description we also can't treat sensible qualities or sensation as as things happening in in a consciousness and a couple of reasons for this he gives first there's no explanation of why why is it the case that red produces the smooth movement um, and there ought to be if if we're talking about something in consciousness something that the, a, a constituting consciousness is directing you know we're, we're, we're at this idea then of the the subject being in control determining what and how things are perceived um, so there ought to be some kind of explanation why red produces smooth movements blue produces jerky movements but there isn't um, and also another reason it, it off this this these effects these physical biological sorry not biological the uh, the physiological effects uh, that we're describing they're not they're not conscious these are things that happen beneath conscious awareness so it's not we can't reduce this to the the, the willed act of a consciousness which is which is controlling which is directing um, everything that's going on uh, okay so we have let me move on with this idea that we have the perception we, we apprehend sensible qualities and then we have this reaction or this this effect in our bodies these aren't two distinct facts, Merleau-Ponty points out. So we don't have the sensation of the red and then the motor reaction. I'll read the quote for you. The subject of sensation is neither a thinker who notices a quality, nor an inert milieu that would be affected or modified by it. The subject of sensation is a power that is born together with a certain existential milieu or that is synchronized with it. And so, again, we're just going, um, picking out that middle path between idealism and empiricism. It's engaged, and we're, we don't fall into either of those, those categories. It's more um, ambiguous. There's a more ambiguous, hazy relation that we have, um, that we establish with objects uh, when, we are, when we're sensing. Um, okay, so they're not two distinct, distinct facts. This happens at the same time. This happens together. And uh, let me see what's next. Okay. You remember perhaps the sleep, the analogy we made, or Malo Ponti makes, with sleeping when we go to sleep. Um, and, and the way that we go to sleep, we have to kind of give ourselves over to it. We can't make ourselves fall asleep. And he talks about having to kind of adopt the position of a sleeper. 
we we take up certain acts we slow our breathing down we 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 calm our mind and then we just kind of wait and then sleep comes if you're lucky um and you know and so there's this this element of passivity there which is important i think and it's something that is very much glossed over or or um disagreed with i think by by many of our of our kind of public intellectuals these days there's the the, the sense of the human being that the agent is more one of 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 kind of um power and control we're, we're directing things we're not at the whim of anything and to the extent that we are at the whim we're powerless we're weak and so you know everything is geared to kind of overcoming overcoming nature overcoming these um anything that 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 might appear beyond our control we try and exert control over everything and we think that we have more control in our even in our, our personal lives and our thoughts than i think we actually do uh, it's, it's kind of a um it's kind of a paradox the way that, that most people most say scientists tend to think about it i think that they have that idea we, we're in control you know we're, we direct ourselves we direct our minds and that that's that's the belief but at the same time they have this belief that we have no free will anyway and so we're all determined um and th those two are kind of contradictory right but but i think both of those um beliefs are out there and many people i think hold both of them and um and yeah it's worth just remembering that there is this element of passivity there is this um and this was talked about nicely um, by hubert dreyfus in that book all things shining if you if you've read that he did a video on it too the uh, the the way that the <clears throat> the greeks had had their gods and goddesses who who uh, who could who could control situations could could make us do things and and the Greeks kind of accepted that that there was and you know they worked it into their understanding of life and and what it means to be a human and we've kind of left that aside now we've kind of gone beyond that we think so we're not at the whim of anything be they gods or or natural forces or you know Yes, we're at the whim of certain things. We can't control everything, but but there's still this underlying idea that we are in control, and and, and that's kind of what much I, I feel like that's that's where a lot of um, energy is is directed towards gaining control, towards controlling nature, for example, towards manip being able to manipulate things the way that we want, and and dominating. Um, and there's this but there's this other side that we we ought to, to to keep in mind and the sleep analogy is nice and the same thing holds with perception with sensation the way that we perceive red for example it's it's a we have to let the red take us over or let the red um, let the quality kind of sink into us let it do what it's going to do let it make our movements smooth we have to respond to it so it's it's a really this idea that Milo Ponte is getting at it I really like it it's this like he said um synchronizing we have to synchronize with with the um milieu that we're in <clears throat> and he he gives some more of these this this type of idea um in this quote the sensible is nothing other than a certain manner of being in the world that is proposed to us from a point in space that our body takes up and adopts if it is capable. And sensation is literally a communion. And there, there, there it is, that word communion. That's a nice description. We've, we've talked about sensation as a living, um, living connection, I think it was. <clears throat> Same idea. There's we're harmonizing, synchronizing, communing with objects around us, which means we're not dominating them and we're not being um, dominated by them. 
in, 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 sen in the sense that we're not controlling anything and it's just cause and effect, stimulus in, behavior out. Um, there, there's, there's this middle ground and it's a, it's a nice way to describe it as a communion here. <clears throat> so the sensible is a manner of being in the world, just going through that quote. Um, and the idea of communion, there's a rejection of the subject and the object. So a rejection of this, this um, juxtaposition of these two, having the, the subject on one side and the object on the, the other side <coughs> of a ledger. Rather, um, you know, we have to, there's a middle ground. I'm just repeating myself, aren't I? Being doesn't exist for one who steps back and is, is, and is him or herself outside of being. So... Again, against that, that kind of the Sartre idea that we are consciousness about, we're always removed from. We've got to bring those two, the subject and the object, together. But again, in a way that doesn't, <clears throat> doesn't reduce to that Bergsonian idea we talked about a few videos back, um, where, where the subject and the object merge. We're not, we're not eliminating the subject or the object. The two remain. But they're not they're not on kind of opposite sides of a court, you know, trying to trying to to um, communicate or, or interact in some way. There's a, there's a closer relation. Okay, I think I've I've hammered that more than I needed to. Um, so what does this mean? This idea where sensation is a communion. This means that we don't posit things as objects. Rather, we relate ourselves to them, sympathizing with them through our bodies. Another nice expression. <clears throat> and so this means that things retain their opacity. It means that they, we don't get all of the thing. We don't get the whole thing. Things are not constituted in full clarity before us. Um, <clears throat> and basically the reason for that is, is if, if they were, if, if the, the, an object was, was accessible to me or apprehensible by me in its entirety, if I, if I knew everything about the object, if I saw it from all perspectives, if it had nothing left, um, if it had nothing left beyond me, beyond my, my gaze, then it would no longer be an object before me. It would no longer be an object which I could perceive. So in order to, to it's like it needs, it needs to hold something back in order to, to be tangible, in order to be, um, to have a bit of density for it to appear as an object in the first place. So it holds something back. We don't get the we don't get the object in its entirety, but that's not to say that we have a mysterious essence here. <clears throat> it's, there isn't some un forever unknowable core <clears throat> which we can't get access to um, through some limitation. So it, it's not Kant's thing in itself. We're not reducing the the object to that and, and we're just getting kind of what we what we put onto the object um, <clears throat> that's not the idea it's just that the the object preserves some of its individuality it's um, the the thing that makes it what it is the word that Milo Ponte uses is hexiety it retains that hexiety it, it's still separate from me um, but not, and it still it still has something, which which you know I'm not seeing at the moment. Uh, but it's not a it's not a hidden essence. It's not like there's a a metaphysical reality I can't get access to. That's not the way Milo Ponte thinks about it. Um, okay, so the thing is, it's not laid bare before me, but it's not absorbed into me either. There's this middle ground. Um, oh yeah, and something I forgot to mention with that idea of the subject and the object kind of merging. Another problem with that is that 
you can't commune with yourself in order to have, in order for there to be communion possible, in order for there to be a relation, there has to be something else. There has to be an other to you. And uh, we talked about that with Kant as well. And the problem, the reason why the other isn't a problem for Kant, other people, is because underneath the, the appearances, we're all this one transcendental mind. Um, so I've, uh, there's a short quote, which I'm not going to throw up on the screen, but I'll just read it for you. Rather, I abandon myself to it. I plunge into this mystery and it thinks itself in me. So I abandon myself to the object. I plunge into this mystery that is the object that retains a little bit of a little bit of its mystery. It doesn't give itself completely to me. And I, what a great expression, right? And the object thinks itself in me. I mean, that, that's just such a nice way of, of describing this. Um, he goes on to talk about the sensible. Again, these are just different ways of, of describing sensation and sensing. Um, and so in a, in a sense, I feel like I'm just repeating myself, but but I feel like that there are a lot of, you know, each each approach is, is slightly different and just gives a, a, a nice, a, a more complete picture. So another way that he talks about sensation he says the sensible poses a poorly formulated question to which my body must respond another way to think about how sensation takes place how perception takes place and uh, and that's nice right the object presents a question and we have to respond and we do respond through our bodies um, and again well, maybe not again. It's, what's important here is that the thing, now turning to the, to the object itself, the thing is active in perception. The thing is, is not just a passive object pole, as in Sartre, or perhaps Husserl. That's, that, that language sounds like Husserl a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so it's not, it's not, again, it's not the subject imposing anything on the object. Can't. The, the subject with his or her um, categories, the categories of understanding, kind of imposing them on, on this external reality, which we can't know in itself. Um, rather, the thing is, is takes an active role in this, in this act. It asks the question, we respond. It invites us to look at it, to, to approach it in a particular way. And we, we do. Um, and I've got a quote which I will throw up on the screen. Thus I am not to recall Hegel's phrase, a hole in being, but rather a hollow or a fold that was made and that can be unmade. So, okay, uh, there's, this is kind of, again, a direct, direct um, criticism, perhaps, of obviously Hegel, but also definitely Sartre, who, who also talked about the for itself as being a whole in being. <clears throat> That's an interesting phrase. Um, and I really liked it when I first read it in Sartre. And it did, I mean, it does capture something interesting, something kind of um, important about consciousness. But, um, but Malo-Ponte is saying that's not, that's not what we are. We aren't this weightless, empty subject. This nothingness. We're not nothingness. Rather, we, we're a hollow which is filled by these sensible qualities, filled by objects in the world that we, that we, um, that, that think themselves within me. And I quite like that expression. We're a fold that's made and can be unmade as, as if, um, we are literally, physically, bending and, and kind of twisting in response to the world, in response to objects in the world. Um, so I think that I, that's just such a nice way to put it. So um, I really wanted to, to stress that. Okay, uh, so how we've, we've talked about the way that the for itself and the in itself are, um, are, not, are not juxtaposed. We ought not to think of them as... as on two on different sides of a ledger and 
Well, Pondi talks about two reasons that we ought not to think like this. The first is that um, every perception takes place within an atmosphere of generality and is presented to us as anonymous. <clears throat> and so this takes us back to that, that the phenomenal field, um, which, which we're talking about all the time. Every time we talk about perception, we're talking about that perception as, as it is an originary perception, as it, as it happens in that phenomenal field. Um, so this is every perception takes place within this, this atmosphere, this anonymous atmosphere, contains that element of, of passivity that I've, I've emphasized as well. Um, and so there isn't this the strong notion of a coherent, uh, unified consciousness acting. Um, because, because it is anonymous, it's general, this atmosphere, this phenomenal field. And he compares this, he compares perception in this way to birth and death. In the same way, um, birth, you know, our births happen to us, or, but we, have, we had no... No, no control over them. We didn't direct anything, and yet it's it's an important, obviously an important event in everybody's lives. And death as well, same thing. It's it's right at the limit of your life, um, and in a way, it's not even going to happen to you because by the time it happens, you know you're no longer around to experience it after it's happened. And um, so there's the he. Yeah, he, I mean, he, he makes that comparison, birth and death with perception in the sense of being anonymous in this general field in which we are, we're not a, a directing consciousness. Um, so let me give you a quote. I experience sensation as a modality of a general existence, already destined to a physical world which flows through me without my being its author. And there, that, that last section is, is the carries the weight, I think, there. It flows, this physical world flows through me without my being its author. I'm not in control. I'm not, I'm not determining what's happening here. Um, so there's that passivity. <clears throat> and the other thing that Ponty says here, um, the other reason he gives for why we, we ought not to separate for itself and the in itself, is that sensation is partial. It's, as we saw, it's never, a, the thing never lays itself bare before us. We always get limited, um, limited views. We are, we're always approaching the thing from a limited, restricted perspective, which isn't, isn't something that, that's not something we ought to overcome. It's not something we can overcome because it has to be that way in order for the object to appear as an object in the first place. <clears throat> so sensation is partial. Um, so again, we don't have the sense of, of an in itself um, there for us, waiting for us to, to kind of to grasp in its entirety. Uh, so there is no sense in which we can juxtapose the in itself and the for itself. Some, uh, I've written a little summary here. Every sensation belongs to a field. Every sensation belongs to that phenomenal field. And that's why there's no, there is no, um, it's impossible to separate the in itself and the for itself. Um, so I've got a quote here too, which this is getting too many pieces of paper. I've got a quote. Vision is a thought subjugated to a certain field. And this is what is called a sense. When I say that I have senses and that they give me access to the world, I merely express the truth that I am capable, through connaturality, of finding a sense in certain aspects of being, without myself having given them the sense through a constitutive operation. And so a couple of things I wanted to to point out there is the first idea thought is sub subjugated to a certain field so there's that we're not um, it, it contains elements of that harmonizing that synchronicity 
that, that Milo Ponti talked about, that communion. Um, and also, uh, towards the, the end of it, that's what, that's what the sense, that's what sensing is. It, it's this partaking in that field. It's, it's engaging in that field. And we're able to, to find a sense in certain aspects of things because we, we are engaged with the thing through this field, through this phenomenal field, um, through connaturality, through this, this, this kind of innate way that we, we, we share, we, we relate to objects in the world. And importantly there, again, without myself having given them this sense through a constitutive operation. So we uncover a sense that I didn't impose on them, that I'm not um, forcing. There's, there's, before that happens, that, that can happen and it does happen and, and it often happens, but it's a secondary operation. The original, the first, the primary perception is the thing presenting itself to me and you know through this field and 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 this happens um, without me authoring what those senses are or how they how they are manifest <clears throat> okay um just before we move into the the next section i wanted to talk about two types of reflection that Malai ponti discusses the first is the intellectualist type of reflection. Uh, okay, so this is intellectualist reflection thematizes the object as existence in itself. So it makes the object explicit before us and it thematizes consciousness as existence for itself. So we're already abstracting out from any kind of um, more primary, more originary relation. And, and now we've got these ideas, these concepts, and it's those that we're going to start working with. And that's already, we can see, we're no longer dealing with the original perception itself, the original act of perception. We're dealing with these thematized concepts in itself and for itself and he, he specifically mentions Kant here and the a priori categories which he discusses um, in his first critique uh, which so I won't go into I don't want to talk about those exactly what they are but um, in, in too much detail but but basically there are can't identify 12 categories of understanding which which we impose on the things the thing in itself we impose on the world and it's those categories which give the thing some structure which give it give the thing um, meaning um, so those categories without which the world can't be thought and and the reason Milo Ponti is is questioning this this approach is that um, in order to be thought in the first place, the object must not be wholly unknown. And so that's kind of the way that Kant approaches it. He takes <clears throat> the object out there as this unknown, you know, the the thing and seek the thing in itself. I don't know if I pronounce, I'm sure I pronounced that wrong, dingan sik, dingan sik, the thing in itself, we've got that thing in itself which is completely unknown, um, <clears throat> and then the subject imposes these, these categories upon it in order to, to make it known, to make it knowable, but Malopondi is saying that can't be the case because in order for us to even think the thing, before we can, before we can even have these, these um, an intuition of anything, it must appear in some way. It's not completely, wholly unknown. It has to appear before we um, impose these categories on it, or else we wouldn't even 
there wouldn't be anything for us to impose categories on. It must, the thing must appear to us in some way first. It can't be wholly unknown. It must be given. And that's what this phenomenal field is doing. And so he says that Kant's transcendental aesthetic could only merge with the transcendental analytic if I were something like a god positing the world rather than a human being thrown into it. And just for a little bit of very brief background, the transcendental aesthetic is basically Kant's description of um, the sensible, the, the world that we perceive through our senses. And the transcendental analytic is those categories of the understanding that I talked about, which impose order on, on this kind of amorphous, meaningless thing in itself. And then Malo Ponte is saying those two could only come together if we are a God positing the world rather than a human being thrown into it. So the, the God thing is not, not religious in any way. It doesn't imply kind of omnipotence or anything, but it implies something separate from the world. These two, these two ideas, this, the sensible and the categories, could only merge if, if we distance ourselves from the whole process. If we look on it as a third, third, uh, third person, objective um, process going on, rather than from a human, the human perspective, which is in the middle of it. So as soon as we're engaged, we're thrown. That, that's Heidegger, right? Thrown into the world, um, we can't, we can't make sense of of our experience through these kind of detached, overly rational. Um, methods. So that's his response to the intellectualist reflection. And the second type of reflection he talks about is phenomenological. And so he says of this, it's, and it's, it's a little bit tricky to explain, but I'll try. Um, he says that basically this, this type of reflection, so obviously the phenomenological reflection is going to go straight to this phenomenal phenomenal field get get beneath this these um, objectivized um, concepts that the intellectualist reflection has thrown up has put up before us and he says it will require a new definition of a priori um, and such that the a priori will then be unknowable prior to experience um, which is kind of a contradiction in terms, because that's what a priori means, right? Prior to experience, before experience. Um, but he, he, he says that we're going to have to tweak that. We're going to have to change our understanding of a priori. And he even thinks that, that Kant proved this, that the a priori is unknowable prior to experience, but he didn't know it. And it, because he says he didn't, he didn't follow through he didn't follow all of his his um, his reasonings to the conclusion that he ought to have. So we've got this idea the the unity of the senses, which is consciousness, the um, consciousness organizing, bringing order to the the sensible, and that's through those those categories of the understanding. So the unity of the senses here is 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 that, the, the subject um, imposing these categories to make sense of, of the thing in itself. And that was considered the a priori truth in Kant's philosophy. <clears throat> but Malo Ponte says this is actually an expression of a fundamental contingency. The contingency being our being in the world. So this, the the categories of the understanding, the unity of the senses, the, the organizing subject, bringing order to the, the thing in itself, is actually dependent on an expression of our being in the world. And that makes it a posteriori. That means that it's after experience. So what comes first is our being in the world, that engagement, that thrownness into the world, and it's, and it's from that that 
the unity of the senses, that the organizing consciousness can, um, can come about, can arise. And on the other side, the diversity of the senses, and so these are terms that Milo Ponte uses, so if you're reading the book, um, hopefully you can, you can match, map what I'm saying onto, onto something in, in, in the text itself. Uh, the diversity of the senses, which is is the actual, um, the sensible impressions, the sensory impressions that we receive from from you know, external reality, the thing in itself. So the diversity of the senses, the way that this, this information this um, comes to us through through different senses, and, and which is supposedly organised by. The, um, the categories. This diversity of senses was was considered a posteriori before, but um, now we see that this is actually necessary to our experience, and this makes it Milo Ponti thinks a priori. So he's kind of taking those words necessary and contingency, and basing a priori and a posteriori off them. <clears throat> so the first one is unity. The unity of the senses was actually dependent on being in the world, which meant that it's dependent on a contingent um, situation. And so that made it a posteriori. And the diversity of the senses, the, the, the different, the range of different sensory inputs that we receive is actually necessary for there to be any experience. And so this would then make that <laughs> this would then make that the diversity of the senses a priori rather than a posteriori so hopefully that makes sense um and there's a little bit of a semantic game here because you can you can play but play it both ways right you could you could you can see what what Kant's getting at here the unity of the senses is necessary in order to have some a full experience of being in the world and the diversity of the senses is then um, is contingent on that that um, the unity brought by the subject. So you can see that it kind of works both ways. What Milo Ponti is doing is not saying that that he's reversing Kant, which isn't actually happening. Rather, he's he's just um, he's just emphasising that that's not the only way to see this. It's not the only, Kant's position isn't the only way that we can interpret what's going on. It can, this, this difference between a priori, a posteriori, contingency, necessary, the unity of the senses, diversity of the senses can also be seen in the, in the opposite, from the opposite perspective. And that means that the unity and diversity of the senses are truths on the same level. And so that's that's really the message in this section of of the book. He's not reversing Kant, which um, which which doesn't really make sense. It would just be a kind of semantic game. But he's he's pointing out that the a priori and the a, a posteriori are not um, then they, they, they don't have the the, the difference that. That can't allege, that can't attribute it to them. So we, we can't separate them, the unity of the senses, the diversity of the senses, the way that Kant did. And in fact, they're on the same level. They're, they're both truths on the same level. He says the a posteriori is the fact, a priori is the fact understood and made explicit. And so that's the way he 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 finds a middle way there between those those kind of extremes that, that can't raise. So hopefully that, that made some sense. It makes kind of sense to me in my mind, but I'm not sure if, if, it, if I got it out um, in, a, in a meaningful way. Um, and it is just closing off this section, Malopondi gives an example of the way that every sensation just kind of giving an example of this this a posterior posteriori a priori um, equivalence the, the way that he raises them to the the same level he talks about um, spatiality 
every sensation is spatial, but not because it can only be conceived in space, which is Kant's position, and which was why space was one of those 12 categories, uh, but because sensation constitutes a milieu of coexistence. And, and that means space. A milieu of co coexistence is space. So it's not, he, he's, he's saying it's not this, this constituting subject, this mental um, subject kind of imposing spatiality on, on some fundamental external reality which isn't spatiality, which isn't in space which doesn't have any spatial um, characteristics. Rather, he's saying every sensation is spatial because sensation itself is this milieu of coexistence. It is this, this space in which we can commune with the object. And in order for that to happen, we need, we need space. Um, and... and but it's just the, the emphasis is not on is, is on us not creating space, not forcing space on the on the objects, on the thing in itself, but on the act of sensation um, <clears throat> creating this 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 middle ground, this meeting ground where we're able to to um, engage with things. And that also demonstrates nicely, I think, the unity and diversity of the senses. So touch is, um, so we usually think of spatiality as being something we, we, we grasp through vision. We can see space. But he says, Meloponte says, touch is also spatial. So, for example, you know, if, you, if you close your eyes, you, you reach out with your hands. Uh, or for someone who's blind, the um, spatiality is still apparent. But this, but now through touch, so we're still, you know, if it if it wasn't the case, what are they? What what is what is a blind person reaching into? You know, there, there is that that feeling through space, but there's there's still this understanding of spatiality. Um, so it's diverse in the way that each sense is spatial in a different manner from the other senses. But it's united in that they're all spatial. All the senses are spatial. So there's, there's the unity of the senses, but there's the diversity of the senses. Same level, um, and we see that kind of at play, the way Meloponte describes sensation. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to stop this video here. We're only halfway through, but um, I don't want to turn this into like a 90-minute 90 plus minute video. So I'm going to stop here. I'm not going to summarize what we've done so far. I'll leave the summary for the next video. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, let me let me take a break there. You can take a break too, relax. And I'll catch you in the very next video, I guess, which will be 12.2. Maybe. Cool. See you soon.